Okay, now for the first, let's say, more standard presentation, we cross over to Vancouver, where we will hear from Professor Marco Selsa, who is a Canada 150 research chair at um, the University of British Columbia. Margo has a very long history in operating systems, bordering databases. Um, she, has, she did her um, PhD at Berkeley, then was a professor for many years at Harvard, including head of department. She was actually the one who brought Harvard on the map in systems. Normally in Boston, you had heard only about the um, Technology Institute down the road. Um, she turned it into a first-class systems research place. Um, she, now, she then moved to UBC. She's a fellow of the ACM, uh, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and hot off the press. Just overnight, the mail came in that she has just with her colleagues been awarded the Software Systems uh, Prize of the ACM. Um, so congratulations on that to start with. <laughs> And so, so it's very timely because what she got awarded this prize for is what she's talking to us today, namely um, the Berkeley database. Um, Berkeley DP, DB was sort of a different kind of database system, and I'm sure Marco will tell us all about that, um, that was tightly um, entwined with the Unix system. She did that starting when she was at Berkeley, that's what the name, um, it led to a company called Sleepy Cat Software, where she was the, um, one of the three founders. It was all open source, so that's an, another um, connection to today's theme. And um, was for change in a symbiosis with the operating system, whereas before that, operate, databases tended to fight operating systems. They tried to get the operating system out of the way. So, Berkeley DB was a different approach. So um, Margot's topic today, when databases met Unix, a love affair is obviously very fitting to today's event. Um, remember to submit your questions via slider. And I hope Margot is here. And well, Margot, are you here? I'm here. Can yes, you hear me? Yes, she is. OK, over to you. Excellent. And you can see my slides, I presume? Yes, we do. Excellent. OK, so thank you for that wonderful introduction. The timing could not be more auspicious given the award that we just found out about. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm excited to be here for many reasons. I never had the pleasure of meeting John, but there are so many people here who I consider my heroes and role models. So I'd like to start with a little shout out first to Brian, who is really the person who taught me how to communicate technical information in an accessible fashion. So I'll be expecting a grade from him after this. Um, similarly, I see that Butler's on the program and Butler is the person who taught me what object oriented really means. And then I wish Ken were still here because he's the person who taught me to never, ever, ever trust a piece of software. And finally, Rob Pike will be here from whom I learned two important things. One is everything I know about Olympic archery. And the second is that naming is really hard. So, as Gurnau alluded to, I want to talk about the relationship between databases and Unix, but I'm going to do that in the context of a history lesson. So as someone who has spent my entire career uneasily positioned between the database and the operating system communities, I've often wondered why these two communities barely talk to each other. And, and I'm struck, wait a minute, Okay, I'm really sad because there's a brilliant piece of animation that is supposed to happen here that isn't happening. There we go. So I'm always struck by how people in the OS community and the database community don't talk to each other. They don't read each other's publications. They seem kind of proud of that. And they even have their own words, right? So, you know, the, um, I have a feeling that the slides are on to like move by themselves, and that would be very unfortunate. Um, if it is, we might have to stop them and start again. Anyway, um, have you ever wondered why the database community talks about logging 
while the operating system and file systems community talk about journaling? Like I've wondered that and I don't have a good answer. So I can't promise you that I'm gonna answer any of those questions, but I am going to try to go through this history of how operating systems and file systems have interacted and how that has led to where we are today in what I think of as the post-relational world with NoSQL and all sorts of other solutions. So that's our roadmap. The story starts in the 1960s with the release of Sabre, which was the first online airline reservation system. It was a project between IBM and American Airlines that went live in 1960. And it was designed to run on IBM 7090 mainframes. So you might wonder, like, what was the operating system on a 7090 mainframe? And the answer is there really wasn't much of one. It was a small control program that basically read punch cards and, and did whatever the punch cards told them to do. And so it turns out that what really happened is that Sabre was a full-blown multi-user system. And so the database basically wrote their own operating system. And I think this is what, what paved the way for this uneasy relationship. So that was 1960. In the mid 60s, IBM introduced what is arguably the first general purpose database, IMS, the Information Management System. And this was implemented on what was known as the hierarchical data model. And perhaps most importantly, it introduced the notion of transactions. And so once again, it was really a system where the database ruled the world and the operating system kind of just got out of the way. Now, late in the 1960s, this group called Codacil, which was actually the group that invented COBOL at the turn of the 60s, so like between 1959 and 60, got together and decided to standardize on a data model um, called the Codacil data model, which was called the network model. And if you look at this picture and squint a little bit, it looks a lot like a key value store. Now, even so, we were in a world where databases ruled and the operating systems were really subservient to them. And I'm gonna represent that by the cute little graphic that shows the database and the operating system really merged together as one. Before we go to the next decade though, I wanna take a brief diversion and talk about what else was happening. So IBM was off building these database systems like IMS and they pioneered something called ISAM for indexed sequential access method. And the idea was that you would lay out all your database records you know, there they are on disk, nice orderly fashion, but hard to find. So if you wanted to access them sequentially, great. If you wanted to look up a particular record, like you're out of luck. And so instead, ISAM was an index that was auxiliary to the data that sort of pointed directly to the records in the database. And so if you wanted to do queries, you programmed them. Right? You looked up something in the index that got you to a record, you read the record, you got something out of there, and then maybe you read another record using the index. Well, again, if you squint a little bit, this is really a key value store. So, so here's the first thing that hasn't been published that I should tell you, which is that ISAM was the fundamental index method underlying COBOL. And in fact, the inspiration that ultimately became Berkeley DB about 50 years later um, was actually the need to provide fast, efficient transaction support for COBOL programs, which was a project I worked on in the 1980s. All right, so what's really going on in this decade of the 1960s is that we're starting in a world where the operating system and the database are tightly coupled. They are essentially one thing or you know, the database is totally ignoring the operating system. And we're gonna to start to see that these two personalities are gonna come apart. And it's that coming apart that leads to some of the tension, perhaps we shall say, between the database and operating system software as well as perhaps the communities. So I would hope that everyone here knows what happened around 1970, which was the publication of Codd's landmark paper proposing the relational model. So if you think about how I described that network model, it was a program intensive way to get your data. You had to essentially understand precisely how your data was laid out, and then you would follow pointers and things to get answers to questions. And Cod proposed, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe what we should do is we should decouple 
how we think about the data from how we actually implement the data. And if we do that, then we can have users submit these ad hoc queries and the queries themselves will be totally decoupled from how we implement it. And that will give us the freedom to implement databases how we see fit. Hugely great idea. Dominated the industry for about 40 or 50 years. So how did that happen? Well, in what is perhaps the greatest coopetition in our field, there were two groups, both in the Bay Area, the Stonebreaker group at UC Berkeley doing Ingress, and the um, IBM Almaden Research Center database group. So starting in the south, we have System R in this corner. And what they were building was a relational model to run on an IBM VM370. So let's think about what VM370 really looks like. It's a virtual machine operating system. So the way you supported multiple users is that you gave each user their own virtual machine. Gosh, I haven't heard that before anywhere. But if you're building a database management system, having every user on their own virtual machine for which sharing was really not a high priority, you have a problem. And so it turns out that in order to make system R work, they needed extensions to the virtual machine facility of IBM 370. And in particular, they needed to allow virtual machines to share virtual memory among a collection of them so that you could essentially have a multi-user system. So that was the architecture that, that System R was doing. And so the way to think about that is sure, the OS and the database were separate, but these guys actually went in and just changed the shape of the operating system to make it look like what they wanted to. In contrast, our friends at Berkeley couldn't do that because the database group was like this academic research group and the OS group was the CSRG who were producing Berkeley Unix. And so Berkeley Unix was like a thing now, it was an operating system. And so rather than the database people being able to mold the operating system, what we have is the operating system is kind of setting the rules of the game and the database group is having to live with that. Now by any metric, Ingress was wildly successful. However, as we move into the 1980s, we discovered that this left Stonebreaker bitter in certain ways. And so there is a famous landmark paper that explains just how terrible operating systems are for databases. And so Mike cites a lot of problems that fall into about five categories. So the first is buffer management, right? All these, you know, his friends down at IBM got to manage their own memory. They didn't have to rely on the operating system to do that. In Unix, the operating system gets to control memory. So the operating system decides like, what's the replacement policy? The OS makes users make copies of data. You could get double buffering and end up doing too much IO. So we didn't like the buffer management system. We also didn't like the file system because the file system implemented a tree structure to find your data but it wasn't the tree structure the database people wanted. So they had to overlay their own tree structure on top of the tree structure that was the file system. So we didn't like that. And then of course there was scheduling processes. You control the operating system, you get to do that. They don't control the operating system, they're at the mercy of the OS scheduler. And in fact, we don't have multi-threaded processes yet. So that was kind of sad. A problem you hear a lot about even today, there is no mandatory locking. So locking was, if it existed at all, it was discretionary. So how did you actually coordinate multiple processes? Um, and finally, virtual memory address spaces were typically represented by really big linear page tables. And when you started having big processes, those page tables took up a lot of space. So what do you do if you're a brand new graduate student in the 1980s and your advisor has just published this really widely read paper about how terrible operating systems are for databases? Well, clearly what you do is you set out to prove him wrong because that's a really, really good career strategy. So I was a dumb graduate student at Berkeley in the 80s and I was taking Stonebreaker's course and um, I thought that extensible linear hashing was really cool. At the same time, the Berkeley folks were, um, let's say, saddened by the fact that AT&T was suddenly charging very, very large sums of money for licenses to Unix. The Berkeley folks had rewritten major portions of the Unix kernel, but they couldn't distribute it without 
the whoever they wanted to give it to having a license from AT&T. And your typical CS department who really wants to have like an OS to play with cannot afford a $150,000 license from AT&T. So the Berkeley guys were kind of sad. And so they were trying to build an unencumbered system. So their own operating system based on, of course, Unix principles, but they needed to free up all the code and that meant freeing up all the user level utilities of which there are many. Three of those are HSearch, DBM, and NDBM, all hash packages. So being a not very bright graduate student, I got sucked into building a new hash implementation. Now, the person doing that was Keith Bostic who had an ulterior motive. He was gonna have to write VI and what he wanted underneath VI was some sort of record management system so that he wouldn't have to worry about managing all the lines of data in a, pro in a file. Simultaneously, Mike Olson was my office mate and he had been in industry for a while. And every time he went to a company, the first thing they had him do was build a B-tree implementation. So his goal in life was to build one last B-tree implementation and never have to do it again. So, and then there's this deep dark secret, which is that ever since I'd done this project in the early eighties to build a transactional record manager for COBOL, I've never written a line of COBOL, just saying. I'd always wanted to build this library version of such a transaction manager. So something Brian mentioned earlier is that, you know, opportunity happens and this was clearly one of those opportunities. So I got together with um, some folks in Canada. There's a heavy Canadian recurring scheme in the program today, just saying. Um, and we built this hash package. And then I roped Mike in and we built this library transaction manager. We called it libtp. And so in 1990, here was what precursor to Berkeley DB looked like. And it was completely designed to be a Unixy thing, right? We had a bunch of completely separate libraries. The libraries had clean APIs. Each of the libraries talked to the other things. And if you hooked them up in just the right way, what you got was sort of the internal guts of a database management system. That is inside every commercial big database server, somewhere there is this teeny little component that is giving you reliable storage. They might have multiple different implementations of it, but somewhere deep down, that's what they're doing. So the way to think about this libtp is that it's what happens when you try to solve a database problem while fully embracing the Unix philosophy. So this is what became DB185, which shipped with 44BSD. This is ultimately the code we started with to produce Berkeley DB for Sleepy Cat software. It was all licensed under a Berkeley license. We continued to keep it open source. We, according to the um, you know, award, pioneered the dual source license, but, but it was basically, how do we figure out a way to let people use this as an open source library? And at the same time, if people are selling proprietary software, we wanted them to actually get a license from us. And so it was the mother of invention was trying to figure out how to do that. It means you spend a lot of time talking to lawyers. Unsurprisingly, the graduate student code that Mike and I wrote changed a little bit to become the commercial product that you all know and love as Berkeley DB. However, the core premises of this architecture remained the same, which was be faithful to Unix and implement it in a Unix style. So when I talk about the database OS love affair, what I really mean is having the database embrace some of these principles. Right, so you can think of the principle of Unix is do one thing and do it well. So each of our libraries was designed to do one thing and do it well. Now, fortunately, operating systems had matured between the experience Stonebreaker had doing Ingress in the 70s and what we had in sort of the late 80s and early 90s. So MMAP was a wonderful invention for those of us building databases on top of operating systems because it allowed us to do the kind of buffer management we wanted. It allowed us to build a multi-process lock manager that actually worked well. Um, threads happened, wasn't that nice. So on one hand, the operating system matured. On the other hand, what databases needed to do also changed. So if you think about what motivated SQL, the problem that SQL was trying to solve is that you didn't want to program queries in because you had human users who wanted to make queries of the data. And that is still true. But in the mid 
the late 90s, all of a sudden it wasn't users who were putting these strong demands on your database. It was really programs that were putting demands on your database. And so when programs are issuing queries, the game changes a little bit. So these were first generation web services. Performance mattered. That was the name of the game. I had to be able to get customers data really quickly. The data they were storing was actually relatively simple. Additionally, because these were programs generating queries, the queries were a fairly fixed set. The standard Berkeley DB customer, you know, they had to implement five queries. So the fact that they had to code those in instead of using SQL, not a problem. Most of them didn't want to use SQL. So the landscape for the database had changed, which enabled sort of this new model of how we're going to think about it. And I will claim that this is exactly the transition that has continued in what we call the NoSQL movement today. So I think of NoSQL as what happens when you turn over data management to OS people instead of database people. And so what you get are things like KV stores. We do one thing, we do it well, you look up keys, we give you values back, we do that really well, we do it really quickly, we scale great, okay? Um, and it's funny, there's this quote um, on Wikipedia, and I can't remember if it's on the IMS page or the DB2 page, which is Oracle's relational data, or IBM's relational database, and it says, in general, IMS performs faster than DB2 for the common tasks, but may require more programming effort to design and maintain for non-primary duties, right? This is exactly what we're seeing here. There's a bunch of applications for which the data is simple, the queries are simple, and that's where KV stores really came in. And then we expanded NoSQL to mean things like document stores and graph stores and column families and triple stores and this store and that store, and it's all good. Now, what were the database people thinking? So again, we will use Mike as an exemplar of the database community. And he was pretty anti NoSQL. Ironically, at the same time, he was off giving his one size does not fit all talk and doing a series of research projects, each of which became a company designed around the premise that if you build a custom database for a particular class of applications, you can get an order of magnitude performance improvement. And so there were streaming databases and column stores and scientific databases and in memory databases and this database and that database. And I think it's about 10 companies. But in reality, what really has happened here is that rather than the OS and database kind of fighting with each other, we, we sort of all came to the same place, which is, you know what? There's a lot of room for a lot of different things. So, and now what's happening in NoSQL? They're adding SQL to it because sometimes you really do want to do ad hoc queries. So I think if you want to take anything away from this, the real takeaway is that technology continues to evolve, but we often go back to sort of the same set of core values, right? No SQL really, really does harken back to the days of network databases. And now we're, we're going forward and saying, yes, and those network databases also need to have query languages. So, if there's one thing I want you to take away, you can forget all the details of the history. One, it is if you are an OS person, you need to love your customers who are applications. And two, if you are a systems person in general, and I encourage you to think of yourself that way, it's really important to think of systems broadly and how my particular box interacts with other particular boxes and to think about really solving problems. So on that note, I think I am done. I will be happy to take questions. I think we probably have a little bit of time for that. And I'm gonna guess that Gurnot is gonna run that. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Margot, for this um, extremely insightful and entertaining talk. Um, I don't see any questions on Slido. Am I looking at the wrong place? I don't know, I might have to make up my own questions. Okay, no, no, no question. Okay, are there any questions in the room? So, what happened to Berkeley DB? 
Well, so let's see. So um, we were acquired by Oracle in 2006. And, you know, there's the, the Berkeley DB now has many different personas. So in addition to the what we call the core product, which is the product that, that most of us are familiar with, we also built a Java product. And so it turns out that um, our Java product was a, a clean slate re-implementation of the Berkeley DB design and AP, or API, but designed natively to work well with Java. And it turns out that if you use Oracle's NoSQL database today, the per node storage is actually BDB Java Edition. And the team that built Berkeley DB Java Edition is in fact the team that has built Oracle's NoSQL database. So Berkeley DB lives in that vein. Um, and I believe I've been outside of Oracle for a while now, but I am pretty sure that we are embedded in several systems inside of Oracle as well. Um, and then of course we have open source users who do all sorts of interesting things because in fact the code is still open source today. Okay. Apparently there is something. <laughs> Um, all I can say is not a question, but, ah, um, oh, this is an interesting one. Uh, did any observation from the Linux book inform your understanding of databases? From which book? The, the sorry, the Lions book. <laughs> the Lions book. So, um, unfortunately not. I was sort of just a generation kind of after the Lions book. Um, and so only in so much as that all the people I learned everything I know about systems from, they were all students of, in fact, right. you know, the Lions book and that heritage. But I'm just a tad too young for that. Um, what's your opinion of MongoDB? <laughs> okay, um, full disclosure. So um, whoever asked that question, I am married to Keith Bostic, my co-founder of Sleepy Cat. Keith went on to found a second company with his Australian counterparts. That company was called Wired Tiger by no accident. And Wired Tiger is in fact the storage engine underneath MongoDB. So that is my full disclosure notice. My perception is that I know nothing about MongoDB kind of above the storage layer, shockingly. Um, my perception of Wired Tiger is that it is what would happen if we set out to do a clean slate design of Berkeley DB, starting with, you know, 2014 technology, in, actually earlier than that, 2010 technology instead of 1990 technology, right? So 1990, if you wanted to scale, you built, you, you bought big shared memory machines. Usually they were big sun workstations or sun servers. By 2010, that was not how you built scale out you built, you had multi-core systems that needed to be able to do gazillions of threads all at once. And so Wired Tiger is really built to do that. So, you know, I'm married to the guy. I'm a fangirl. What can I say? Okay, final one, which is a bit philosophical, I guess. Uh, do you think that the word DB, that the DB world domain, sorry, start again. Do you think that the DB world consolidation stifles innovation? Um, yes and no. So the big companies are not the ones who are innovating. However, what I see is that everybody and their brother is trying to build a database product. And if you are successful enough at doing that, then you get acquired by one of the big guys. So I don't think it's that they're really stifling innovation. I think it is like most big established markets innovation moves away from the big companies to the little companies and eventually those little companies get gobbled up right. so um you know whenever i'm in the bay area i inevitably get contacted like oh i have a new idea for database startup can we talk and um you know the first question i ask is so so tell me what your revenue model is right if you're going to actually try to build a product and you want to have a company i would like to know how you're going to make money and usually that ends the conversation right there so um, I think there is innovation happening. One of the challenges is figuring out how to get revenue producing innovation. And as somebody in academia who likes to build stuff that has impact, that's super hard. All right. <laughs> okay, thank you, Margo, for joining us. I'm sure that 
if, without COVID, you would actually be here and present oh, in yeah. person, knowing how much you, you love Sydney. Um, just well, slight actually, disclosure, you know, I tried say... to... I tried to attract Marco to UNSW for a while, um, but um, UBC won out, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I just want to say that the Women's World Cup is coming to Australia in 2023, so you can guarantee I will be there for a long time. <laughs> Looking forward to that. So please join me in thanking Marco for giving this great presentation. Oh, it's great to hear from you, and congratulations again on winning the ACM Software Systems Award very deservedly. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Have a good evening.